This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Let us begin. Um, I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, now Professor Rob Lydiard, who was you know, a mere stripling when I first knew him, and so was I. Um, who had the misfortune to lecture me as an undergraduate, and, and uh, I'm not going to tell anyone present how long ago that was, uh, for fear that embarrasses either of us. Um, uh, and Rob is well known um, as an expert on castles and deer parks, and uh, more recently pillboxes, but that's not the subject of tonight's paper. Tonight uh, we're going to do one of his other uh, expert- areas of expertise, uh, which is um, the medieval deer park, and more, more accurately, the end of the medieval deer park. And uh, when you're ready, Rob. Well, Lovely, you Adam. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you also to Richard, who uh, invited me to give this paper last year when I was external examiner at Reading. Um, this is a paper paper that I should have published several years ago uh, but haven't um, and Richard said well if we invite you to give you a, 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 a invite you to come and give a seminar then you know that will speed up the writing process um, I have to say I'm afraid it hasn't but it has forced me to revisit a lot of these things I don't normally read papers but I'm being pod whatever the verb is to podcast I am being podcasted uh, so uh, I will stick quite closely to my text if that's all right just so it can't be used in evidence um, against me um, but the subject as Adam said of my talk uh, thank you all for coming I should say as well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, What I want to do this evening for you is to discuss a topic that until recently uh, has rarely been addressed in writings about deer parks and medieval parks especially, that is disparkment. We are of course uh, well accustomed to discussing the origins of medieval deer parks, their development and the various roles that they played within the medieval landscape, but their breakup and their extinction uh, has always seemed to attract less attention from scholars, uh, perhaps for the simple reason that decline is never as interesting as rise. Um, uh, now the best general discussion of disparkment as a phenomena is that by Cantor and Hadley in their seminal article on deer parks published in the journal Geography in 1979. And absolutely typical of this pioneering uh, work, it contained the essence of the issue. The afterlife of medieval parks comprised one of two trajectories. Firstly, there were those places where medieval parks were incorporated into post-medieval pleasure grounds or landscape parks. As they put it, the medieval hunting park could only survive by adaptation. This is Chatsworth, a fantastic landscape uh, uh, park of the post-medieval period, has at its core a medieval deer park, survival by adaptation. And secondly, there were those places uh, that did not feature in such grand schemes and which at some point were broken up and turned over to agriculture. That's not such a quite pretty slide because it's just a field in Suffolk. That is the site of Kelsale Park, uh, established about 1200, uh, um, disparked in the uh, late uh, 16th century, been turned over to uh, uh, agriculture uh, uh, at that time. And of course this trajectory, this twofold tra- trajectory, is basically what happens, but I do think it's worthy of greater exploration. And Cantor and Hathley also presented an outline chronology of disparkment. The Black Death and the decline of Demean farming was the first blow. Demand for arable in the 16th century encouraged conversion of parkland. Agricultural improvement encouraged this trend into the 17th century, while the Civil War was the death knell of the medieval park and ushered in the landscaped grounds of the 18th century. Uh, Looking back on that, some 35 years on, that has a certain teleological quality to it as an argument. We know what's going to happen, you know, kind of that or that, and there are various kind of stepping stones along the way that help us to, to uh, get there. Obviously we would see things, I think, slightly slightly differently now. And the purpose of my paper for you this evening is basically to pull together the, ma- the material for disparkment with a view to exploring those two tra- trajectories a little more, and I also want to problematise disparkment as a phenomena. And in so doing, I want to question the idea that the death of the deer park was in the century before the Civil War. Rather, I want to argue that it lay in the century after the Civil War. Uh, whether or not I'm, I'm successful in this, uh, I hope to raise the profile of an otherwise under-researched subject, which does indeed touch on a range of other issues relevant to this seminar. Um, but I want to begin, and I should say this is a work in progress, um, uh, um, uh, and I'm sure that will come out in questions. There'll be lots of things I need to think about. Um, but I want to start, well, I'll end with the post-medieval park. Uh, this is simply to emphasise that survival by adaptation is often not straightforward. And in those cases where we do indeed have medieval parks, 
parks on the site of post-medieval mansions, the relationship between the medieval and the post-medieval elements is often far from a straightforward transition from one to the other. Uh, this is one near me, Blickling Hall uh, in Norfolk, early 17th century uh, house. Uh, the post-medieval park did indeed lie on the site of a medieval park, but there was a very complicated process that went on, on for over a century. <laughs> Um, which brought one into contact with the other. That you can see there on the left is the remains of the medieval park boundary owned by the bishops of Norwich. This was itself disparked uh, by the time the house was built. The house originally had a park with it that was itself disparked, only to be uh, enlarged later and, en en and encompassing the site uh, of the medieval one. Um, I'll return to why a bit later on, but this is simply to say that survival by adaptation, as you've seen, is far from straight straightforward Forward, and in some cases survival is more apparent than real. Often there's a, a kind of complex process by, why, by which one becomes the other. But turning to the, to the majority of parks, those that didn't find themselves caught up in such a, um, a scheme, any attempts at analysis are bedeviled by a lack of precise numbers. We simply do not know how many parks there were in England in 1450, 1550, 1650 and so on. But as we'll see a bit later, we are perhaps moving towards an appreciation of the general trend. But the difficulties in obtaining an overall picture is compounded by the fact that new parks were being created at the same time as old parks were being broken up, and further complicated by the fact that it's not always easy to say when a park was disparked, as we'll see a little bit more later on. But underlying this is a more general problem of studying parks, as anyone here who's, who's done it will know, as enclosures they display considerable variation in character, which means that what goes for one park in one parish need not apply to that in its neighbour, or need not apply to its neighbour in an adjoining parish. And because I think because of the, the kind of difficulties of the sources here, a, a review of the secondary literature rather quickly finds an elastic chronology of disparkment, uh, with some authors saying that disparkment starts to uh, uh, happen from 1500, others say 1600, but with most observers settling on the century between 1550 and 1660, 1660 as the key period of disparkment. And indeed various explanations have been put forward to explain declining numbers. The Crown rationalised its numbers of parks. The Reformation saw ecclesiastical parks transferred to gentlemen who frequently broke them up. Improvements in agriculture meant that the marginal land upon which parks were sited could for the first time be profitably managed. At the last, the well-documented disparkments during the Civil War and Interregnum proved to be the death knell of, of the medieval deer enclosure. From then on, a, um, a continuing trend had emerged. From then on, continuing a trend that had emerged from the 16th century, the park increasingly became the adjunct to the country house. And I think this idea that there is some kind of dis disconnect in the 16th century between the medieval park on the one hand and the post-medieval park on the other hand, it's very strong in the historiography. It's recently been confirmed by Stephen Mileson in his fantastic book on medieval parks. And after he makes a very strong case for saying that the idea of the park remained vibrant right up to the end of the 15th century, making an argument for saying that numbers of parks in England held up uh, into the 15th century, then goes on to say that the post-Reformation period affected the purpose and function of parkland. So there's this idea of a disconnect in the 16th century, which I always one of, one of the things I want to examine in this paper. But I think before all that, we have to understand the medieval background. If you want to understand what's happening to parks in the 16th, 17th centuries and later, we have to look at recent work on medieval parks. And this park needs to be set against the conclusions of a number of scholars who studied the Middle Ages. To summarise their main points, uh, we've put the deer and the hunting back into the deer park. If you look at Rackham, for e e uh, example, he argues that the, that the deer park wasn't a hunting landscape. That's now, uh, uh, I think, been revised comprehensively. We've put the deer back into them. We've put the hunting uh, back into our parks. Uh, there's also been a trend uh, for scholars to argue for increased or rather buoyant numbers of parks overall in England right up to the end of the 
the Middle Ages. Rackham famously kind of put a figure on what he thought, how many on how many parks he thought there were in medieval England in the Middle Ages. He came up with a figure of 3,200. Um, these kinds of numbers are supported by Mileson at a national level, but also by county surveys um, as well. So there doesn't seem to be a fall off in numbers of parks at the end of the Middle Ages. That's the conclusion from the, med from the medievalists. Thirdly, I think we have a much greater appreciation of the use of, of the use of parks as private wood pasture environments that sustain a range of management regimes. That's I think is quite important. These are flexible, dynamic private wood pasture uh, landscapes that can be used in a number of different ways. Thinking of the work here of Morehouse uh, and Angus Winchester on upland parks in Yorkshire and in Cumbria. That's Troutbeck Park in Cumbria. You can see the line of the uh, this the stone line of the pale uh, uh, there. The whole valley's been um, um, parked and and Morehouse and Winchester are very clear that parks, particularly in the late Middle Ages, are being used primarily as stock in enclosures for sheep and for cattle kind of ranches rather than uh, so much as, as kind of deer farms or kind of hunting landscapes. So there's kind of flexibility here. And finally, scholars have been at one in stating that the role of the park as an emblem of social status, both for established families but also for part of the news, were again vibrant up to 1500 and there is a clear association between parkland and residential surroundings for the purposes of recreation, uh, uh, leisure and social status. This is Castle Headingham in Essex and you're looking over the little park here which was uh, made almost certainly in the 1490s right at the end of the Middle Ages. The, the building there you can see is the uh, site of the lodge, now Little Lodge Farm and you're overlooking does this work? Yes. You're overlooking uh, the site of a suite of fish ponds stroke water garden, uh, 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 which would have you know, looked very pleasing uh, when viewed from the uh, lodge, you know, right at the end of the Middle Ages, the continuation of a, of a medieval tra tradition. So any discussion of disparkment in the post-medieval period needs to be set against this medieval background. One of high numbers, but also particular trajectories as an adjunct to the house, as, a, as enclosures where flexible regimes of management take place. But it also needs to be set against a medieval background of disparkment. Um, because I don't think what's been sufficiently appreciated is that while we are accustomed to thinking of disparkment as a post-medieval ph phenomena, it certainly occurred earlier. And 1100 to 1350 might well have been a, a time which is characterised by expansion and growth of numbers, but it's also the case that disparkment occurred um, as well. And sometimes we can see it. This is not disparkment, or rather it's encroachment. This is Coventry of all places in the mid uh, 12th century and the expansion of the suburbs of Coventry to the area here four and, and five uh, actually expanded over the site of the medieval deer park a very very early uh, example of, of, of kind of a deer park shrinking in size uh, rather than growing and equally there are other albeit opaque documentary references to disparkment as well Rosemary Hoppet has found some in Suffolk Dennington Park she argues appears from charter evidence to be being granted out in parcels over the course uh, of the 13th century and I think what's happening here is you've originally got very large deer enclosures of uh, some kind that are progressively being kind of reduced uh, in uh, size leaving them either very very small or getting rid of them completely. It's surprising how few parks that are named in Doomsday Book for example you can actually trace on the ground and I think it's because a lot of them probably contract or go very very early. I see some nodding faces so that's kind of good on the right lines um, here. And perhaps more common in the Middle Ages is this example here. This is Rivenhall uh, in Essex and 130 acres were taken from the park in two encroachments in the late 13th century both of which were marked by the construction of moated farmhouses. So what you've got here is this is the original line of the park pale and you can see two chunks have been taken out of it by Porter's and Storey's farm uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the 13th century. Um, and there was a further encroachment um, in the early 15th. And by that day, over half of the original park was given over to agricultural land. Now, what actually happened later on was that Rivenhall Hall down here then expanded its park uh, 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 over the site of the medieval one, which has left it intact, survival by adaptation. But I suspect if that trend continued, that part would have gone completely. Uh, um, and I think situations like that at Rivenhall were doubtless seen elsewhere, although on what scale is difficult to quantify. But I think processes like this probably account for uh, the kind of uh, 
the kind of places you will know them if you've studied this. You get normally the patent rolls or the close rolls, you get one reference to a park, normally before the 13th century. You get out the tie the board map, you start looking on the ground, you do all the stuff you would do. You can't find it. Where the hell is this place? You know, um, great, got, got some nods here, so that's kind of good. Sk I know just no one. Skaten Park in Norfolk in 1290. Turns up in the patent rolls, Commissioner of Oye and Termine, uh, touching trespasses in the park of John de Skaten at Skaten County of Norfolk. Where the hell is Skaten Park? No idea. You know, I suspect it's probably happened like this. It's kind of gone, and it's gone relatively early. I think. Um, so we need to place what's going on in the 16th and 17th centuries against that context. This part doesn't begin after 1500. So turning to that key time then, the 16th and the 17th centuries, um, of course there's a great deal of anecdotal evidence for this disparkment and the reason given is the general rise in agricultural rents and prices brought about by a growing population. In 1576, for example, William Lambard commented that almost half of Kent's parks had been lost within memory. A year later, in 1577, William Harrison commented that, for the owners of a great sort of them begin now to smell out that such parcels might be employed to their more gain, and therefore some of them do, gr some of them do grow to be disparked. Similar sentiments were expressed by Richard Carew in 1602, who reported that in Cornwall, gentlemen taking their lead from Henry VIII, preferring gain to de delight, or making gain their delight, made their, de made their deer leap over the pale to give the bullocks place. But it's often the case there is anecdotal evidence for the complete opposite, sometimes by the same authors. Um, William Harrison also talks about England having a great plenty of parks and that gentlemen were en enlarging existing ones. Gervais Gascoigne in 1577, the noble art of hunting, extols the benefits of parks as an estate asset and doesn't mention disparkment at all. And a mixed picture is uh, argued by Fines Morrison, who, is, who in, is in his itinerary of 1617 stated that parks had now grown infinite in number but that many of these grounds are by gentlemen disparked and converted to feed cattle. So you can take your pick at which bit of the anecdotal evidence you want there, you know. Uh, but clearly that evidence is pointing to a fluid situation and one that is not entirely straightforward, I think. But clearly enough parks were being turned over to other uses to draw comment, and indeed this is found in other sources, such as that in 1617, when the Council in the Marches of Wales recorded that Sir Charles Fox re refused to show by what title he doth hold Oakley Park and keepeth there more cattle and sheep than deer. And I think you start to see this as well very clearly in the cartographic sources. Um, and what's interesting is that when, or immediately before this parking takes place, there seems to be an emphasis on stock keeping in the local economy. Uh, this is in South Norfolk. Uh, uh, this is a fantastic map of 1614, uh, showing the breakup of Windfarthing Park. And what's interesting is if you look at the field names surrounding Windfarthing Lawn, you've got the Bullock's Close, the Steer's Close, the Neat's Close, things like that will often turn up. So this is giving a sense in, in what's going on on the ground in these places is at the moment of uh, disparkment and, and in slightly kind of get going a little bit there there you can see the park being broken up a new with a new division being run uh, across it so there's agricultural specialization going hit on here it's faint but I hope you can see it this is a map of Hoxton Park um, in uh, Suffolk from 1620 you can see that is the park you will should be able to see they are they are cows and not deer you know it's quite interesting at this time actually cartographically for the park you're getting you know other beasties um, actually being depicted and when you get field names or areas within parks that are sometimes depicted on cartographic sources again you get things like Bull's Meadow actually within the park it's telling us that there's specialization uh, going on um, a particularly clear example of disparkment comes from North Shropshire and, train, and changing land use in the parishes of Wem and Whitchurch. Um, in the century before the Restoration, the area witnessed a rise in agricultural output, partly brought about by an increase in the area under cultivation and more intensive use of arable and pasture, which involved this, this parking. Number of parks in the area recorded in the 1580s as being wooded but not having deer, and in subsequent decades they were cleared of this woodland, broken up and leased at a higher rent for pasture. And the breakup of one of these parks, Tilstock, is shown on a fantastic map of 1608, 
It's a fantastic map. That's the original. It's almost illegible. <laughs> uh, but we do have a nice redrawing of it. Some of you may already know this. It's wonderful there. Because there you can see it's been divided up into three. You've got the land of Farmer Green, Farmer Gregory, and Farmer Chowner. And there you should be able to see there are, their, there are the farmers, or at least their, their men, with axes. And you can see they're chopping the trees down. So a wonderful cartographic depiction there of what this park actually means on the ground in Shropshire uh, around 1610 uh, uh, or so, 1608. And that what I've just shown in South Norfolk here in Shropshire is obviously played out differently in different places. Of course, it would be in Sussex, for example. It's been argued that the growing presence of forges and furnaces within parks was the reason behind the 28 disparkments in the Tudor and Studer period, i.e. the keeping of deer is incompatible with iron working. Um, but the problem is, I think, is treating cases like this, examples of this, as evidence that the whole concept of the park was on the wane. I think that's what I've got an issue with. Just because we've got disparkments taking place at this time, it doesn't mean the idea of a park uh, um, is, for want of a better term, going out of fashion, because you need to set this against evidence for imparkment at the same time. And Lords, I think, are making judicious decisions about whether to asset strip and sell things off for cash or use their rights to impark to further their own strategies. Imparkment and disparkment is a kind of choice, is, is a kind of management strategy. And another clear case comes from Shropshire, um, documented by the VCH, put that one in. Um, in 1625, John Willey took, for, took a 410-acre share of the recently enclosed Shirelet Forest and immediately imparked it. The woodland used for coppice, coppice and pannage, the grazing for deer, cattle and horses, the new park was also given fish ponds and beehives. There are two functions for this park it seems. Firstly to supply specific foodstuffs for the Lord, secondly a specialised demean stock farm. Any medievalist would recognise that as standard parkland regime yet it's in the early 17th century. There's something very medieval about that, I think, I hope. Um, and also, of course, we've got new parks created with new mansions. This is a before and after of uh, Honeby, Sir Christopher Hatton's uh, Northamptonshire seat. Uh, on the left, you can see pre-park. On the right, you can see post-park in the 1580s. And again, the park is depicted cartographically, as you would expect. You've got its pail, you've got the deer in it, and so forth. There, these are being created at the time that those places are going complex picture. Um, and so what I'm saying is the disparkments of the late 16th, early 17th century are real, of course they are, but they should be kept in perspective. What we really need to know is how that localised picture plays out at a national scale, and that is incredibly difficult. And I'm relying here on the work of Rosemary Hoppet uh, in Suffolk, and Rowe in Hertfordshire, Susan Pittman in particular in Kent. Uh, and, and Pittman has shown very clearly in Kent, via painstaking archival work, that in the 16th century, this part in Kent was associated with the immediate post-Reformation period. Parks going from ecclesiastical uh, hands to secular ownership, new owners breaking them up and asset stripping them. So between 1509 and 1558, about four to six disparkments per decade. That explains why people like Lampard say half of them have gone within living memory. But in, this wasn't the start of a trend. This was a, a distinct event. Later on in the 17th century, disparkments drop between to about two to three per decade very much, and th those losses are being offset by new creations. And you can see this in other counties as well. Um, Hertfordshire, as Anne Rowe has shown, has almost exactly the same pattern. Early 16th century, you do see dis disparkments, but it doesn't become uh, uh, a widespread trend thereafter. Sussex, work of Manning, slightly different. Only six of 121 parks disparked in the 16th century. Some 22 go in the early 17th century for those iron workings. So you've got a slightly different chronology there. Again, what you would expect. In Suffolk, Hop it, slightly different, more disparkments at the end of the 17th century, but again offset by new cre creations. And, and in fact, in Suffolk, the evidence seems to say there are possibly more parks in the 16th century than they were in the medieval peak in the early 14th. Uh, uh, that's her conclusion. My own work on Norfolk, um, 
of some 57 parks uh, in 1500 in Norfolk. I think 42 were still there by the time of the Civil War. Um, incredibly difficult, as anyone who's tried to do it knows. You're reliant on fragments, scraps of references to parks in the in the in the archives. But in the national picture, albeit with variation, up to the Civil War seems to indicate a similar situation for the country as Pittman has described for Kent. That is, the evidence does not endorse the accepted view either of the increased rate of disparkment into Elizabeth I's reign or the notion that parks would then in general decline. That's, I think, the key point. The, you know, the conclusions from local and regional studies, deer parks do not seem to be in decline in terms of numbers. The second thing, and it's more opaque is this one, is I don't... It's how we read disparkment when it comes to specialising in various agrarian act, act when it comes to agrarian regimes within parks, because specialisation is not new. There's a very long tradition of dividing parks up into compartments. This is uh, Murden Park in Hampshire, showing a fantastic map of uh, 1588 or uh, 1580s, showing the park. It's got deer in. It's divided up into compartments, chiefly to associate, chiefly for coppicing. Down here, you can barely read it, but it's true. It says the Warren. You've got little bunnies there as well. You've got a little warren uh, within the park uh, uh, there. Um, so actually, break, when I say breaking up or dividing up a park and specialising in various kind of activities within it certainly isn't new. I go back to Morehouse, go back to Winchester. In the north of the northwest, entire parks are giving over to kind of stock ranching. We need to see what's going on in the 16th century within that medieval uh, background. So too, I think, for the Civil War. Yes, you know, the despoilation of, of royal parks in the interregnum during the Civil War. It's, dr it's dramatic, of course it is, but it can also be related to more mundane agrarian motivations. The 1650s, a um, period of particularly high prices, a decade that sees 207 new vessels added to the Royal Navy. Sorry, sorry the Navy during the interregnum. So, asset stripping timber and converting parkland makes a great deal of sense. As Ian Gentles has put it, concerning the management of the Crown's lands, um, one can therefore dismiss the traditional view of Cromwell's soldiers as the wanton destroyers of the Crown estates and judge them instead as energetic, if often ruthless, agrarian developers. So I think this parkment, or what you do with a park, which you could specialise within it, you could divide it up, and then you can, or you can break it up entirely. These are strategies, I think, that play out in different places, in different contexts, at different times. Uh, but there is a decision-making process that's being made at any one point in time. It is worthwhile to break that up, or it isn't. Um, and I think we should see, we shouldn't see a binary opposition necessarily between emparked and disparked. That's what I'm kind of saying. Um, because when exactly is a deer park disparked? Now, this sounds incredibly easy and straightforward, and that should be quite simple, but actually it's not at all clear-cut, um, as I hope to explain uh, now. Um, and I don't know the answer to this, so I very much welcome kind of comments and questions uh, 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 on this one. Very clear example from Brigstock in Northamptonshire. That's the Woody Park Pale, or what's left of it, the park boundary there. Here, the park was at the centre of bitter legal dispute between Robert Cecil, Earl of Salisbury, and the community of Brigstock in the early 17th century. In short, Cecil wants to enclose the park, and the men of Brigstock, who have extensive grazing rights, want it retained as a park. In 1603, Cecil began the process of enclosing, and the men of Brigstock used various means to prevent the disparkment. When the deer were being driven out, the men of Brigstock stuck on the stood on the pale and attempted to keep them back, with some su success. An altogether more unusual device was the gathering of, and I quote, a troop of lewd women from Brigstock, who were sent into the park in an effort to distract Cecil's men from their labours. <laughs> I kid you not. It's in Pettit, this one. It's there. It's documented. But whatever the charms of this particular group of ladies, they were to no effect, however. And in the end, Cecil's plans went ahead, and he realised over a thousand pounds from the sale of wood, and a few years later was receiving over a thousand from from rents. But the legal wrangling over his actions continued, however, and it was only in 1612 that he received official confirmation of his actions via a licence to dispark. So that seems straightforward. However, the park had been subdivided into 14 separate closes as early as the 1580s. 
Now, while to us that might signal disbarment, these enclosures did not, it seemed, signal discontent on the part of the community of Brigstock, presumably because dividing up of the park didn't interfere uh, with their grazing rights. Secondly, after the 1603 enclosure and its associated protests and the 1612 legal extinction, the area is still referred to as a park in documents. 1634, 15 people made offers for parcels of the park. And the integrity of it as a, as a land unit was preserved in the up until the uh, early 18th century and beyond. The map of 1728 shows the bounds. Uh, you can see there, that's the bounds of Brigstock Park, still being referred to. You see there, Great Park, Great, Brigstock Great Park. There was a little park uh, next to it. And as late as 1760, it's still being referred to as a park. Now, um, at what point then was Brigstock disparked? When it's first divided into closes, when the Red Parkland regime was drastically altered, when the deer were driven out, when it was disafforested, or when the former land use was no longer uh, re remembered. Um, it's unclear, is, is, is what I'm saying. You can kind of argue about when it, exactly it was. A similarly blurred case comes from this wonderful place, Ersham Park in South Norfolk. Typical medieval deer park owned by the Dukes of Norfolk. This was in parks by about 1200 at the latest. Here you see it on a map of about 1700 or 1720, which shows a far more complex situation. It is a depiction, as you can see there, of Ersham Park. Yeah, but you can see it's divided up into closes. Can you see the pale is still depicted cartographically? And we'll go zoom in on the bit on the lower right. That's not deer keeping by any is it? You know, um, what you've got there is is somebody with a plow plowing it up, and you've got wonderful kind of I presume they're turnips or something like it being given to the cattle there as well. Um, now, what on earth is this? What on earth is going on here? And there are other, other examples as well. Sh uh, Paul Stamp has got some from Shropshire. If anybody knows any more they can put me on to, I'd be very interested. What is this? Is there an integrity to it based on its former land use? This has been a park for several centuries. Just because you take the pale down, it's still referred to as a park. There is some evidence from Hoppet from Suffolk that there was an idea that parks were tithe free or tithe exempt. Therefore, it's possible that by keeping it as a park, you are gaining advantage there. I wonder actually whether the answer is connected with it's an estate asset. You never know when you might want to put deer back into it. Therefore, you maintain it as a park. Um, for kind of long-term use as, a, as an estate asset. Um, um, I don't know. What's very interesting is that Pittman from Kent has got examples of leases from parks from the 16th and the 17th century where the grantee who is getting the lease, in the lease it says they have to upkeep the pale. You know, even if you're kind of granting things out, you're getting the grazing for five, six years, you've still got to upkeep the pale. I wonder if there's something similar uh, going on here. Is it the moment the pale is broken down that it ceases to become um, a park? Um, I don't know, um, but it's interesting. And there are more of these places, I think, knocking around the English landscape around 1700 that we give credit for, I think. And you can read this, I suppose, in teleological terms. You can say, this is the afterlife of a medieval park. Um, this is a cartographic depiction immediately before it is disparked, or perhaps you could take another view and say that when the time this map is drawn up, that is what a medieval park looks like around 1700. You know, it's still a vibrant entity in its own right and it still has use as an estate asset. That's one to, to kind of discuss and ponder, um, I think. But to sum all of that up, what I'm really saying here is that the chronology of disparkment can be stretched at both ends. You can take that classic 1550, 1650, you can pull that back into the Middle Ages, you can also extend it beyond 1660 with uh, examples such as uh, such as this. Many disparments, I think, are not seemingly clear-cut events that get rid of enclosures once um, and for all. And so, to sort of nail my colours to the mast here, I don't think it's surprising we see disparments in the 16th and the 17th centuries. We saw them in the Middle Ages. There are particular economic circumstances at that time. Yes, you would expect them to, some of them to, to go. Rather, I think, and the evidence also, I think, is that many more of these enclosures survive up to 1660 than we otherwise might imagine. So the real question is, when is the death of the deer park, or rather when is the death of the idea of the deer park, deer park a paled enclosure, wood pasture, hunting deer, when does that go? That's I think is possibly um, the real question um, that is worth um, answering. And I think if you try to answer that question, 
you actually find that the, the medieval idea of the park goes in the century after 1660, not in the century before. For I think there are four interlinked causal factors. How am I doing for time? You're doing all right. I've got. Oh. Have another 10 minutes. I've got another 10 minutes. That's absolutely perfect. I, can I just say, does that all make sense so far? Well, yeah, marvellous. OK, because here's the, here's the kind of, the ex, here's the answer, I suppose, or at least hopefully getting to the answer. Wonderful. Thanks, Adam. Um, the first concerns changes in hunting practice and aristocratic consumption. Um, up to the 17th century, uh, I think, Venison as an elite food stuff, that's fine. Hunting with parks, absolutely fine. And indeed up to about 1700. Thereafter, we, seem to, we begin to see some important changes after 1660. Despite efforts after the restoration to restock parks, deer, I think, was losing status. A legal watershed was the passing of the 1671 Game Act, which specifically excluded deer from the list of species that counted as game. Legally, at least, deer was no longer classed as game, rather it became private property and could be taken, could only be taken on an individual's land with the permission of the owner. Legally, stealing deer was on a par with stealing any other property. It's not now a game animal. Now, that does not mean that deer stealing was not taken seriously, because of course it was. Yeah. Um, but deer as game animal, its status seems to be changing um, at this time. And when you think about the classic medieval gentry uh, dispute that involves park breaking and taking deer, classic medieval kind of gentry dispute carries on into the 16th century. I'm struggling to find examples of that after 1660, of gentry disputes which, which kind of involve the kind of forcible taking of deer. I think the status of, of deer is, is going down. If we take hunting practice, the last English monarch to engage regularly in hunting deer in medieval fashion was Queen Anne. And thereafter, the crown took less interest, and partly as a consequence, hunting deer goes into decline. George I maintained the royal buckhounds, but they were rarely used. Um, he famously was taken deer hunting early on in his reign, but he found it so boring he went off to shoot ducks instead. <laughs> Which is kind of quite good. Um, during the reign of George II, due to a shortage of stock, carted deer, that's deer that you've gone out caught and you kind of bring them back specifically to kind of chase, um, had, to be, had to be hunted. And this continues into the reign of George III. But in 1793, the Prince of Wales disposed of, the deer, of his deer hounds entirely. You know. um, also by this date, deer hunting was, was derided by most commentators. In the sporting magazine, for example, in the late 18th century, deer hunting can be described as the lowest of all possible sports without stimulus nor science. So that's pretty rubbish then if you're kind of doing that. Yeah. And of course, by the end, so by the end of the 18th century, the hunting of deer was comparative, I'm saying compar comparatively rare. Of course it still goes on. It's comparatively rare. And of course, we also have the well-documented rise of fox hunting, which becomes predominant over the 18th century. In the words of a recent study on the place of hunting within the post-medieval aristocratic landscape, fox hunting, emergent throughout the 18th century, became by centuries end dominant, while hare hunting and stag hunting became residual. And that, I think, is the key thing. It's residual. Stag hunting over the course of the 18th century becomes residual. And I think such changes were both a cause and an effect of, of an overall decline in deer stocks. This is very difficult to kind of pin down, but it seems to be that deer stocks are on their way down. I mean, even as early as 1725, with the Black Act, which might have sought to protect deer from thieves, but deer stealing was rare. As Lane put it in his classic 1975 study of the Act's impact, he said deer stealing went down, not out of terror at the Black Act, but simply because there were fewer deer to steel, um, which I think is quite good. And I have a letter uh, from a South Norfolk park, a place called Tibbenham, 1721, I think it is, where uh, the, the owner is, is writing a letter to his friend, and he's actually surprised, because he says, a wild buck came into my park this morning. You know, he's obviously surprised that a wild deer has actually got in. Um, I think it's because deer, deer stocks are, are kind of, uh, or deer populations are, are, are relatively low. And, of course, linked into this, I think all these things now are kind of interlinked. Aristocratic preferences in terms of food move away from venison and into other forms of game and into beef. Game books, for, ex for example, make it very clear that from about 1750 onwards, it's partridges and then pheasants that are being hunted in parks and not deer, with the skill of the hunter being judged by how he takes down birds in flight rather than bringing down a heart with a gun or with a spear. Um, and of course, now I've said that, of course, when you look at game books and estate books, what you find is where 
where in parks there are stocks of gear, yeah, it's deer. Yeah, venison is given out as gifts. You know, you might give out uh, live deer to stock someone else's park and, and, and so forth. But it's very difficult to kind of see actual evidence of hunting deer in parks once you start to kind of move into the, uh, into the 18th century. So we've got the decline of venison as an elite foodstuff. So there's, you know, fox hunting, over stag hunting, and we've got venison declining um, as well. Very difficult to gauge this, obviously still used as a prestige gift, but its contribution to aristocratic diets seems to decline. Uh, there's one site where zooarchaeological evidence seems to support this view, or at least give you a, a sense of this, and I've cleared this with Naomi Sykes from Nottingham who says it's fine, so you know, if it's good enough for Naomi, it's good enough for me. Um, Dudley Castle, uh, you've got the excavation there which produced relatively large numbers of, 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 of deer bones, and when you take the percentage of deer bones when it comes to deer, cattle, sheep and pig, quite quite interesting this, it's only one site but still nonetheless quite interesting. Up to 1533, 19% of the total number is coming from deer. As we start to move into the 16th, up to the Civil War, declines a bit, then you notice how it really does drop off as we start to move in that 100 years after the end of the Civil War. Yes, you still find recipes for venison in cookbooks, of course you do, that's fine, and this is only one one site, but I think it's probably the case that um, the, the consumption of venison is going down. And from 1720 onwards, widespread cultivation of turnips, which allow more stock, particularly cattle, to be carried over the winter and also fattened as well. So, you know, Englishmen enjoy their beef over the course of the 18th century rather than uh, their venison, I would see. Which leads on neatly to um, the very loose term agricultural improvement. Um, and if we've already seen those disparments of the 16th and 17th centuries were related to broader economic changes, by the mid-18th century, that bundle of, of, of things that we lumped together as the title, under the title Agricultural Revol Revolution, I think ensure that those medieval parks that are still around in the landscape, particularly those, I think, that are on what is normally termed marginal land, can now be put to other uses. Uh, this is an example I know well, Castle Rising in Norfolk. This is a map of the former park um, in 1736. Um, it's completely broken up into closes. There's a schedule that goes with this which shows that in that, or in all of the fields there of the former park, they are being cultivated as arable. Now this is, but that park existed as a park from the mid 12th century up until almost certainly about 1725. Um, I think once you start to get into this period, you can actually do things with that marginal land. This is very light soil here. It's uh, acidic. What you're looking at here is improvement via marling, that sort of thing, uh, whereby for the first time I think you can actually make a decent fist of actually cultivating that in a way that in the Middle Ages you, you uh, couldn't. Um, this I think is seeing the breakup of parks. Here's one on clay. This is from, this is kind of uh, from Norfolk as well, one I know well, and I like to show it simply because it gets the lodge and the deer symbol in it at the same time. Hevingham, uh, uh, this is simply given over to woodland. This is a medieval park that just gets uh, turned over without any sort of major land use in to woodland and it was nestling behind what was originally uh, a palace of the of the bishops of um, of uh, Norfolk now but underpinning i think all of that is a much more deep seated ideological reason that ensures that ensured i think that the days of what we might call the medieval idea of the park were numbered following 1700 because as everyone here knows, the 18th century, writings of agricultural improvement, there's a distinctive there is a distinctive antithesis to the legacy of the medieval landscape. We all know this. They don't like pollards. They don't like Richard Burrow agricultural improvers, that sort of thing. I don't think they like parks either, because the park was part of that suite of medieval landscape features um, that have been termed intermediate production. Parks, warrens, fish ponds, those sorts of things. In the Middle Ages, what is a, a park? Well, it's partly utilitarian, it's partly agrarian, it's partly aesthetic, its central purpose often renders it uneconomic, yet the social cachet of having one makes it extremely important in the, sh in the social landscape of England. And that's a medieval park, a very late medieval depiction, manuscript illustration of a park. What is it? It's an enclosure with strange beasties within, it's wood pasture, it's got trees, and well, what is that? Well, it's kind of intermediate production. It does a lot of different things, all in kind of one. Surrounded by its wooden fence, it's often upkept by, by manorial labour services with pollarded trees. This is Staverton Park in Suffolk, wonderful survival. 
from the Middle Ages. You wonder whether or not, to the 18th century mind, parks are an unpleasant reminder of past practice. And the elite attitude, I think, to them um, is probably best examined with reference to those places where medieval parks were retained and formed the setting for the noble, now classical, mansion. Because while features such as lawns, woodland, ponds were sometimes preserved and incorporated into new schemes, the park landscape 1660 to 1760 was one of formality, one of order, and one with its dominant symbolic meanings derived from allusions to classical antiquity and the nature of form. That sort of stuff is a hell of a long way from that kind of stuff, um, uh, uh, which might seem obvious, but I think it's worth kind of reiterating and worth uh, um, state, uh, stating that these sorts of places are a very long way from the production of specific elite foodstuffs, I think. And really, to preempt my conclusion, all I'm really trying to do here is saying that it's trying to align disparkment with the post-medieval period when of course all the other things that we know with the Middle Ages often lots of them tend to go um, as well. And at which point we can return, look at perfect, look, we, we return to the other tra trajectory for the park in the post-medieval period as the adjunct to the country house. Now the park as setting for the country house has is well rehearsed elsewhere uh, very well. Suffice it to say that deer were, ke deer were kept in parks in some numbers in post-restoration England but that this changed in the 1740s, when it becomes acceptable for the great country house to have parks without deer. Now, in situations where you've got a park, you've got a population of deer, aristocratic owners are clearly happy to keep them on. Very much so. But if you turn to somewhere like Holcomb, in Norfolk, nationally important design landscape of the 1740s, the Cooks. This, the park was being laid out here and the decorative scheme being laid out with no provision for the keeping of deer at all. It's become entirely acceptable to have a park next to a mansion without deer in it. Now, um, I think personally that must rank as one of the most important long-term changes in the history of parkland because I think for centuries beforehand, the park has been synonymous with deer. I think in 1100, 1200, 1300, 1400, 1600, even 1660, you say park, you think of somewhere with deer. You move on to 1740, that's changed. I think that is probably very, very important. It might have deer in it, but it doesn't have to because the term park is changing um, over this period. And I think this gradual change in perception from enclosure for deer to ornamental setting also has a tangible reality on the ground. Because in terms of the physical characteristics of the landscape upon which many new post-medieval houses were situated, the ideal of parkland is different. It's a rolling landscape with you know, trees, that sort of thing. It's a world away from the actual physical locations where many of the older medieval enclosures actually were. Um, I'm going to show you a field in South Norfolk, uh, <laughs> a wet, clay, clammy, interfluvy place in, in South uh, uh, Norfolk. Uh, very flat, very wet. Uh, um, there's an amazing correlation between sites of medieval deer parks in Norfolk and Second World War airfields, you know, kind of high, flat areas which are in park are also the places in the 1940s where, where the military want to build uh, airfields. Um, you can't, you've got, even if you're Capability Brown, I would argue, or William Kent, you've got to work very, very hard to turn that <laughs> into Chatsworth, okay, simply by its nature of its topography. Um, and equally taking this further, when I mentioned survival by adaptation, it's almost, I think, a red herring, because I've found no examples to date where you just have a very simple a very simple, straightforward situation where the bounds of a medieval park become exactly the same bounds as a post-medieval park. They're, they're changing. Bits are being brought in, bits are being kind of ex expanded and so forth. Survival by adaptation might as well be survival by accident, uh, uh, um, I think. Um, but I think the key point here is that the major for the majority of medieval deer enclosures, it's fair to say, in the 18th century, the more the park becomes an aesthetic landscape, the further away that took it from the management of deer. And that must mean that the 18th century saw the afterlife and then the extinction of any medieval deer parks that were, that were left. Something further underlined when put against the 19th century and the Gothic revival when the medieval park made a comeback. Uh, and this is Peckforton Castle 
in Cheshire, built for Lord uh, Tolimash in the 19th century. The view of the medieval ruins of Beeston Castle, 13th century castle you can see there. That area was emparked with a stone wall and Lord Tolimash made sure that roe deer and best of all kangaroos were brought in, I kid you not, were brought in and put on that hill and he was also responsible for the planting of what were then ex ex exotic f uh, furs uh, 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 on the Beeston Crag as well. And what that means is, I think, by the mid-18th century, when you're reinventing the medieval deer park, which is what this is, it means they've gone. But what I'm trying to argue, hopefully with some success, is that they went between about six, seven, 1660, 1760, not 1560 to 1660. Thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate that was a lot of stuff. I do hope it made sense. Um, thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank, thank you. you.